The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I have to begin by commending our first reader for reading half of the Jerusalem phone book. <laughs> this morning we get another one of those Gospels that you just kind of go, what? <laughs> It's one of those that I think Matthew seems to be on this weeping and gnashing of teeth tear. Because for the last three Sundays, everything has ended with, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> Who knows? But before I go into that, I have a question for you. If I wrote you a check for a million dollars right now, what would you do with it? <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Share with the rest of us. <laughs> what would you do with a million dollars? Buy a ton of toys? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Buy a bunch of donuts. That's a lot of donuts. <laughs> Pay off debt. Pay bills. What else? More dogs. More dogs. <laughs> Buy a what? Buy a lot of video games. <laughs> A Ferrari, mom or dad? <laughs> oh, for you. I suspect that if we got a million dollars, we can think of a lot of things we could do with a million dollars. Well, in our gospel for this morning, 
Jesus tells this very odd, at best, parable. He said that this landowner was leaving. Our gospel actually says that he was going away, but the Greek says he left. He packed up his house and he went away. And so he calls his servants and he gives them a portion of what he owned. A talent is worth, in today's currency, $1.25 million. I'll say that again. One talent <laughs> is $1.25 million, million dollars. <laughs> so this first guy comes up and the master hands him a check for $6.25 million and says, go off. And the second one comes up and he gives him $3.25 million and he says, go off. And the third one comes up and he gives him a mere $1.25 million and says, go off. More likely than not, they are not expecting this man to return. So you have just been given a gift of $6.25 million, $3.25 million, and $1.25 million. The first one goes out, invests in the stock market, and doubles his money, $12.5 million. The second one goes out and he buys some stocks and bonds, and he comes back, doubles his money, $6.25 million. The third one, let's call him Jonah, Jonah takes his $1.25 million, $1 million and buries it in the ground. And lo and behold, here comes the master. The first one comes up and says, you know, I took your money, I thought it was mine, and I invested it, I have doubled it, here is your money back. And the master says to him, well, well done. You can keep the money, and I'm going to make you I'm my CEO. Second one comes up. Well, I thought it was my money, so I invested it. And so I now have twice as much. And the master says to him, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to make you head of HR. <laughs> the third one comes up. Well, I knew that you were a wicked and harsh man. I gave you $1.25 million, and you greet me with, I knew you were a harsh and wicked man? You were really starting off on a good foot. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If someone gave you $1.25 million, are you going to begin by saying, I know that you are a mean old, insert your favorite word here. <laughs> Don't think so, but nothing in this gospel tells us that the guy was wicked, does it? Nothing says that he was mean or shrewd. This guy, Jonah, perceives the master to be a wicked and evil person. His perception of the master is what he uses to interpret what to do with his money. And so he says, well, what did you do with my money? I buried it. The least you could have done was stuck it in the bank at 1.25% interest. I would have at least made $10,000 more. And so he takes the money away from him, gives it to the first one, and says, I am going to throw you out, out into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you once again, Matthew. <laughs> it's almost like, Jesus, could you have explained this parable to us? Because here's the rich the one who had all the talents, getting richer, and the one who has very little, the poor, getting poorer. Sounds familiar? The rich keeps getting richer, and the poor keeps getting poorer. Apparently it was true in Jesus' day, and it's true in ours. But I think at the heart of this gospel is really not the talents, but how we, ima how we imagine God. Because how could we see, or could we see God as being the master here? Can we actually see God as the one doling out all of this abundance and we being those servants who a lot has been entrusted to? It really depends on how we see God. So here's a question for you. This is the quiz in the middle of the sermon, making sure that you're paying attention. What is your image of God 
in a word or two, when you were growing up. How did you see God when you were growing up? Benevolent? Love? Keeping a list of the things you did wrong? Caring? Bipolar? Did that? If you read the Old Testament, we, we, we can talk about that. <laughs> What else? What is the image that comes to mind when you were growing up of who God is? Caring? Scary. Others? Fatherly? That could, be, that could go either way. <laughs> you see, how we perceive God will say a lot about how we perceive the world. You see, the thing is, we often say seeing is believing, but I suspect that believing is seeing. This, mas th this servant believed that his master was harsh and judgmental, and so he perceived him to be that, and so he acted accordingly. How we see the world, how we believe the world to be, is what will determine how we interact with the world. I have a really good friend of mine that lives in Cleveland. Her name is Beth. Anytime you go up to Beth and you say, good morning, Beth, how are you? The first thing that Beth says is, I am blessed by the best and highly favored. <laughs> the world could be crumbling down around Beth. She is going to be blessed by the best and highly favored. She is that type of person that if you gave her lemons, she's going to turn it into a lemonade business. <laughs> She is one of those people that no matter what is going on in the world, she is always going to be blessed by the best and highly favored. Beth can be really annoying sometimes. Because <laughs> she is painfully optimistic all the time. <laughs> I mean, all the time. <laughs> but she's a good reminder for me sometimes that we can find ourselves in a funk, woe is me, so much is happening in my life. And don't get me wrong, Beth does not see the world through rose-colored glasses. We know, all of us know, if you turn on the TV, if you listen to the radio, you go on social media, there is a lot wrong with our world. There's a lot wrong in our society. Sexual harassment of women. I mean, the list of things that are happening can go on and on. But if we perceive only the negative, we don't see where God is actually at work in our lives. And I suspect that that is what Jonah missed in our gospel for this morning. He looked for a judgmental, mean, and harsh master, and he acted as if that was true. And the same can be true for us. If we can see the world as it is and still find God present and working in our lives, it changes how we believe the world and who we believe God is, ultimately. How we image God, what we perceive the world to be, will always shape what we look for and what we see. Jesus invites us to change our image of God but also to change our image of ourselves because most of us are told either by society or by our family or friends or by whatever that we are not good enough. You are not deserving. Life is not as good as you think it should be. And if you doubt me, watch any commercial. Any commercial will tell you, oh, the car that you're driving is not as, not as good as the XR57 that has heated seats and reclining lumbar support. Because what you have is not good enough. I mean, shampoo, come on. <laughs> when the commercial is telling you that the shampoo that you're using is not as good as this one, we are told constantly that we are not good enough. But what Jesus reminds us is that when we see God as being that abundant giver, that loving carer in our lives, how we see ourselves and how we see the world will ultimately be changed. We will be people who see ourselves as blessed by the best and highly favored. We will see that we are good enough, that we have more than enough 
that we have an abundance of grace and love and talent in our lives that is worth sharing with each other. Ultimately, Jesus tells this parable just a couple days before he would go through a trial and execution and ultimately his death. And I do have to wonder sometimes if Jonah, our parable person from this morning, isn't ultimately Jesus, the one who will go out into weeping and gnashing of teeth from those whom he loved. But my challenge for you this week is to adjust your sight. Turn off the TV, stay off social media, <laughs> don't listen to the radio. Find those places where you know that good is. But more importantly, find those places where you know that God is. Look for God and goodness in this world, and I suspect that you will find and see God at work here today in our lives and in our world. Because believing is seeing. And seeing is what God ultimately calls us to do. To see God's kingdom here and now in the midst of us, in the midst of our brokenness and in the midst of our hurts and pains that God is continually breaking into our lives and changing our image of the world and of God. My sisters and brothers, you are blessed by the best and highly favored. Now go live like it. Amen.